Good morning, friends. Welcome to all of you today as we celebrate this seventh Sunday in the season of Easter, which means that next Sunday is going to be Pentecost Sunday, which we will certainly want to celebrate in a wonderful way. And then the following Sunday, I just want to let you know that it's going to be our baccalaureate service, the, the day that we honor all of our congregation's graduates from high school. And we'll have something special going on on, on that day and, and some video that will show our graduates. So we have that to look forward to in two weeks. Today, the seventh Sunday in the season of Easter. I want to let you know that the congregation has been looking very carefully at the possibilities for reopening in, on one level or another. And it's been decided by the church council just recently that the time has come for us to allow our quilting group to return to the fellowship hall on Saturdays. Of course, Saturdays are the day that the preschool is not there. So it'll be safe for the kids as well as safe for the ladies. And of course, the children, as we know, are not vaccinated. So they're the most, most vulnerable in our community right now. So on Saturdays, the ladies will come in and do their work. And then we also decided that an Al-Anon group will be able to meet here in a very secluded room on Saturday mornings as well. So we're slowly starting to, on a case-by-case -case basis, allow folks back into the congregation. And sometime fairly soon, I think we're going to be at a place where we can safely allow some people into the sanctuary here and begin to fill in some of the spots in the church. We'll, we'll remain distanced, of course. We'll remain here with our masks on, as we must do inside. Um, once again, uh, families will want to come and worship with us, and it'll be the children that don't have uh, immunization from vaccinations yet. So for their sakes, as well as all the rest of us, will be wearing masks inside when that time happens, not too far down the road. But of course, uh, the real fun has been meeting together outside, sitting together uh, for uh, parking lot services. People are sitting in their chairs and not using masks and singing joyfully. So please join us, if you can, for our 9 o'clock outdoor services. And otherwise, we're always happy to have you join us here in our 1045 indoor service. And welcome to all of you who are tuning in from near and far. We know that there are many of you who are tuning in from a distance, and we're so grateful that you're with us. Thanks for being here. I want to remind you also that this morning, during this service, you can send in your prayer requests. We gather them up, and we include them in our prayers for the church this morning. So please send those in as we go. And we begin our service this morning with our first hymn, which is called Bind Us Together, Lord. Oh, 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious and glorious God, you have chosen us as your own, and by the powerful name of Christ, you protect us from evil. By your Spirit, transform us and your beloved world, that we may find our joy in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. first lesson is from the first chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. This is the story of the election of a new twelfth disciple to replace Judas Iscariot, the disciple who betrayed Jesus. Before we read, I'd like to talk a little bit about the use of the number twelve in the Bible. According to one of my reference, references, uh, resources, there are 12 references to Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus in the four Gospels. That I didn't know. We read of the 12 tribes of Israel and 12 disciples, sometimes simply referred to as the 12. In our study of Revelation, we learn that the number 12 symbolizes the people of God. And now I'm speaking directly to those who are tuning in from afar. Have you noticed the star on the pastor's stole? This star duplicates the stars in our stained glass windows. The five on one side symbolize the five wounds of Jesus on the cross. And the seven on the other side symbolize the seven days of creation. They add up to twelve and surround the people of God who worship in this sanctuary. Beginning with verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. 
Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons. Peter said, friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold through David concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered among us and shared this ministry. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that our Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. They cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now we have a special musical anthem from the Nordic Choir at Luther College.
Please join us in reading Psalm 1 in unison. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on God's teaching day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked shall not stand upright, upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall be destroyed. Our second reading is from the fifth chapter of the first letter of John. We're not sure who this John was, but someone has suggested that we read it as a sermon written by a loving pastor who sent it out to the various churches over which he had charge. A five-point parish in the year 100. Beginning with verse 9. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God, that he has testified to his Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our gospel for today is taken from the 17th chapter of the gospel according to St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. We're not sure who wrote this book either. Some say it might have been John the Apostle. Some say it might be the same person that wrote the book of 1 John. But regardless of who wrote it in person, it is still reflective of the thinking of John the Apostle. Jesus prayed, I have made your name known to those whom you have given me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me. and They have kept your word. Now, they know everything that you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them and know them. They know that they are the truth. They have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world but on behalf of those whom you have given me, because they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name, the name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost, except the one destined to be lost, so that Scripture might be fulfilled. But now, now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word. 
The world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking that you take them out of the world, but I am asking that you protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning, Trinity, children of God. In one of today's Bible stories, we find Jesus praying for his friends, the disciples. He prays as he now leaves them that they will be safe as they go and share his message of love with the world. They are there with him as he's praying and can hear in his words how much they mean to him and how important the time they've spent together has been. It was a special moment and one that must have really given his friends some much needed encouragement. How often do you pray? On Sundays, once a week, every day? Do you pray before meals or right before you go to bed at night? And who do you pray for? If I had to guess, I would say you most often pray for the family and friends you love and care for. You pray that God will watch over them. And at times you pray for yourself. Maybe that God will be with you and give you the strength to do something you really want to do or help you find an answer that you're looking for. You might also pray for others in the world, even those you don't know, who are struggling or sick or facing some really tough things in their lives. It might surprise you that when Jesus was saying this prayer for his disciples, that he was not only praying for them, he was also praying for us, because he knew that you and I as God followers today while it isn't always going to be easy to share that kind of love with others, we're going to have days where we just don't feel like it or things get in the way. Sometimes people can be having rough days too, where they might be acting kind of hard to love. Some people are not going to like what we have to say, or they just don't want to listen. Sometimes the problem can seem so big and too much of a challenge. But like those disciples, sharing God's love is what God calls us to do. And in that prayer, Jesus wanted us to always trust in God and that his love goes with us every day. So whenever we pray, we can try our best to follow the great example of this prayer from Jesus and remember all those people in our lives and the world who might need to know that God is always with them too. So let's see who you can help God encourage with your prayers for them this week. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for showing us how to pray and how to love in so many ways. Amen. Thanks for listening this morning, everyone. I hope you have the best week, and I'll see you next Sunday. Thank you, Todd. Dear friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't forget to buy a lottery ticket. Those were words I heard early one Sunday morning as I was getting myself ready to go off to church and I tried not to wake up my beloved, but then I heard these words from her pillow. Don't forget to buy a lottery ticket. What I said, we, we never buy a lottery ticket. Why should I buy one today? She said, well, didn't you hear the, the pot is really huge right now and you know, if God wants us to win the lottery, we don't want you to stand in our way, so you better buy a lottery ticket. Dutifully on the way that morning, I bought a lottery ticket. Now, I didn't win the lottery that morning, and I can assure you that if I had, I would have quit my... Well, no, let me, let me rephrase that. I, if, if we had won, and I can say this with certainty because it didn't happen, I would have given all the money to the church. <laughs> w wouldn't you? <laughs> Well, not all forms of gambling are necessarily all that bad, and that, of course, is one small form of gambling. But we have another one in our lesson from the book of the Acts of the Apostles this morning, and I'd like to tell you about it and how important that moment of gambling was. You see, this story begins just a few days after Jesus had ascended into heaven. He had taken the disciples to the mount called Olivet, 
and he spoke to them his final commissioning words. He said, I want you to go forth into all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all that I have commanded you. Now go. And with that, Jesus was lifted up into heaven, into the clouds. And they saw him no more. And then there they were, all alone. They must have felt desperately alone. Of course, they'd been left alone before, even when Jesus had died. But he came back in the resurrection and it gave them tremendous hope and joy to be with him again. But this time, now, gone up into heaven, surely not to come again until perhaps in the end of ages, whenever that might be. So alone, they trudged back to Jerusalem. and They had to be wondering and doubting, what in the world are we supposed to do now? Now that Jesus is really gone, they hadn't been given the gift of the Holy Spirit just yet. That was to come a few days later on the day of Pentecost. He was not coming back. They walked back with no direction, no ideas, no vision for the future. They walked back to Jerusalem in a cloud of uncertainty and despair. By this time, of course, everyone was looking to Peter as the leader Jesus had appointed him. And they knew that it was up to him to help them find a way. It was his role, so Peter steps up and makes an important decision. Well, you know, we we need to get ourselves organized. We need to plan for the future. We need to prepare ourselves for this mission that Jesus seems to want to send us out on. We need to figure out what it means to, to go out into all nations, teaching and baptizing in his name. But wait, first there's something else we must do. We must select a replacement for one of the twelve, one of the apostles, the one that Jesus had selected. We need to replace Ju- Judas. No one could imagine what was on Judas' heart or mind for him to do what he had done. He was chosen by Jesus. He walked with him, learned from him, befriended him, was loved by him like all the others, and somehow he turned his back on the master. And then he was dead. Peter decides that he must be replaced. Jesus had wanted for, them to be tw- for there to be 12. 12 apostles, he called them, the commissioned ones. He wanted them to be sent into the world, 12 of them. Well, Judas wasn't going anywhere, so they needed to replace him. Someone commissioned in his place. So the other people, they followed Peter's lead. This makes some sense when you don't know what else to do. This will be a very good first order of business to replace Judas one of the 12, so that the the number 12 remains whole and complete, a good holy number, as Roberta shared with us. And then Peter, thinking quickly, he establishes the rules for the selection. Now, it has to be someone who has been with Jesus from the very start, this this group that followed around with the 12, someone who was there at his baptism, someone who followed him in his ministry, someone who was there at the crucifixion, and most importantly, someone who beheld him in the resurrection. It has to be someone that the master knew, someone that the master trusted. He had to be an eyewitness to the resurrection because without that, he would have no authority and no credibility to be one of the 12. Well, as you can imagine, that, that set a pretty high bar for selection. How many people could there have been in this group that would fill that bill? Of course, Peter, when he's speaking, it says he's speaking to a group of about 120 people. It's not a small number. And they begin to think, who in this crowd could fit the description that Peter just gave? Now, we in our day, we might say, well, why not simply select Mary Magdalene? We know she was with Jesus through all these events. We know that she was with him every step of the way, learning from him and, and being blessed by him, trained by him. Why not select Mary? Well, sometimes in our modern way of thinking, we hear the words of Jesus as he speaks about women. We think he was an early feminist, (laughs) at least from our perspective it seems so, but we can't use our viewpoint from the 21st century and shine it back on those in the first century. The apostles weren't anywhere near there yet, so they felt like they needed to select a man. You can imagine the murmuring in this crowd of 120 people. Who could this be that we're to select? Could it be you? Were you there? When he was baptized, did you see him crucified? Were you there to see him resurrected? Could you be one of the people considered? They murmured for a while and finally put forward two names. There was Joseph, who was also known as Barsabbas, 
And then there was a man named Matthias. Two names. How can we select between them? Well, first, there had to be prayer. The, the apostles knew for certain that God had already selected someone in God's mind. It was simply theirs to uncover the truth of that. So they prayed. Lord, you know the hearts of everyone. Show us which of these two men you have already selected to be part of the twelve, the commissioned ones. And then so as to be clear about whom God was choosing, they cast lots. They took stones, they put a mark of each of the two names on the stone, and they shook them as if they were dice, and they threw them on the ground, and one of them came up right with the mark on the upside. And that belonged to the stone of Matthias. God had spoken. Matthias was to be the new apostle. The die was cast and he took on the role of witness and spokesperson for the resurrection from then on. And that, my friends, is the story of how the very first business of the new church was done. They gambled. <laughs> shaking those stones like shaking dice. And they cast those stones, and the first order of business became complete. They replaced Judas. Now, someone seemed to have taken minutes for this meeting because the story is collected for us in this writing of Luke that we know as the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Maybe it was Luke himself standing there taking minutes. But we have this recording of this first meeting, this account recorded and archived in this book, the book of the Acts of the Apostles. The book of Acts goes on to recount other business meetings that they had, other early church meetings and other major decisions. Who would be in charge, for example, of the, the welfare program that the church was establishing? They voted and they selected Stephen. And who would be the ones to go to the Samaritans, to those new converts there to preach the gospel to them? They voted and selected Peter and John. And then the apostles and the growing group of disciples, they met and debated whether or not they would share the gospel, even with the Gentiles. And when they approved that, then they voted and sent some missionaries along with Paul and Barnabas in their work to go to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews. There were other things you'll read about in the book of Acts that they decided about the use of church funds, about selecting other leaders, about sustaining the mission that, God, that Jesus had given them. All of these, these things recorded. That all sounds pretty familiar to us who belong to Lutheran churches or really any denomination at all. We have lots of church meetings and make lots of church decisions. Church business appears it's been with us right from the very beginning. And like those early church leaders, we continue to rely heavily on prayer and on the knowledge that God is always leading our mission forward in his, in his will. Yesterday, one of our church members, Steve Courtney, and I, we attended the Synod Assembly. It was held yesterday on a Zoom meeting. Usually we like to meet in a large conference hall and have hundreds of people gathered together to do the work of the church. But in these days, we're doing it on Zoom, and we had about 220 voting delegates tuned in to this meeting. We listened to reports. We had some things to vote on and to decide. We voted on the Synod budget for next year. We appointed certain people to committees and in ministries. We voted on guidelines for pastoral salaries and on a couple of resolutions, one to help our church become a more anti-racist congregation, uh, denomination, another to help us focus on world hunger through the ELCA World Hunger Program. I'm proud to let you know that I was nominated for one of the committees, one of the standing committees in the church and especially delighted to let you know that when the election was held, I was not elected. <laughs> because this was the discipline committee. It's the committee that, that they turn to whenever a pastor or a congregation get themselves in trouble, and you can imagine what fun that would be. So I dodged that bullet. This morning, some of you might have known that you could tune in rather than tuning in here, you could have gone online to see the last act of business of the Synod Assembly, which, which was to install our new assistant to the bishop. His name is Asher O'Callaghan, being installed this morning online. Asher O'Callaghan. Gosh, doesn't that sound like a great Lutheran name? Most of the book of Acts recounts the more interesting parts of the ministry, 
the preaching, the healing, the baptisms, the speaking in tongues, the arrests and imprisonments, the stonings, the dramatic escapes, even the raising of people from the dead. The book of Acts includes all of those things. And this is fascinating stuff, and it's what we love to hear about it. It makes the life of a disciple seem exciting and filled with adventure. But then, along with it, there is this administrative stuff, like electing apostles and bishops and working on budgets and sitting on committees. All of the disciples get to have a hand in this on debating and deliberating and voting and making these decisions, just like we do today just like Steve and I did yesterday at the Synod Assembly. Of course, we don't cast stones any longer. We made our votes yesterday through this online mystery of digital communication. It was state-of-the-art voting, just like casting stones was back in that day. And through it all, just as in our more active ministries, we prayed and we trusted that God would guide us, We are Pentecost people, and we always trust that God is leading us into his mission. Whether it is work that is dull or dramatic, whether it is administrative or adventurous, God is leading us. I want you to know that I'm associated with a a new education ministry down in Naples, Florida, held at Emmanuel Lutheran Church. Wonderful congregation, just like us at Trinity, but the pastor had a dream that they might, because of their specific location, a dream that they might find some way to train Spanish-speaking leaders for the Spanish-speaking congregations in Florida and the Caribbean and elsewhere. He dreamed that dream, and I've been privileged to consult with them on this subject for a number of years now. And I can tell you that some of this dream is utterly fascinating. God is bringing them students from Central America and from the Caribbean. They even have eight students that have joined them in their program from, of all places, Rwanda, that nation in Africa. And it's so exciting to see what's happening. The teaching is exciting. The trips to Africa have been very adventurous, as I've been told. The students are filled with God's spirit, and it's a very fascinating ministry. But then, along with it, there's all the paperwork, and the phone calling, and the fundraising, and the meetings, and the curriculum development, all of those things that seem less interesting to most of us. And yet this new ministry is being richly blessed with students eager to become Lutheran pastors, ordained pastors in our church, with donors who are excited about this vision, and with administrators who love to see what God is doing in this grand new venture. I want to tell you about my friend Howard. He's the one that was, that was hired to be the chief administrator, the CEO of this new organization at the church. And Howard, he, he grew up in a, a non-practicing Jewish family, but he got the vision, he caught the vision of this ministry, and he wanted to sign on and became its CEO. And Howard has only been recently baptized about six months ago. He was waiting for the right time to to be baptized. And he was just thrilled to death on the day of his baptism, which took place in the Spanish-speaking congregation of this this congregation. And since then, Howard has been just thrilling to work with. Every time I speak with him, even on Zoom, his exuberance comes through. And he's smiling, and his lively belief in this program just jumps through the screen. And every time you say something good that is happening, he says, oh, that is just awesome. It's just so awesome. I've never heard a man use that word so often, but he believes it, and he uses it because that's the only word he can find to describe the joyful ministry that they're doing down there. All of it from the beginning has been surrounded by prayer and the firm belief that God is with it, God is behind it, God is within it, God is blessing this ministry. And God continues to send just the right people to be a blessing to this ministry. Teachers, administrators, even office assistants. In fact, I want to tell you about one more great example. Their most recent hire is a woman who was about early retirement age. She was a a very important CEO of a large company in the Twin Cities. But she had lost the meaning in her work and was looking for some way to have a more meaningful life and a more meaningful way to spend her days. So she was thinking about giving it up if she could only find the right thing. Then out of the blue, a friend called her from Naples and said, Judy, you you need to come down to Naples. I think think God might have something in store for you down here. So Judy, feeling led by the Spirit, she gets on the airplane and she goes down to visit Naples and she becomes acquainted with this new ministry. She comes back immediately. She, She resigns from her work. 
she moves down to Naples and she became part of this new administrative team. Now, she's not doing high-level executive work like she's used to. You know what she's doing? She's sitting at, in at the meetings, the Zoom meetings, sitting quietly, taking notes, making sure that everything is done just right, making sure that no walls are dropped. And she is happier now than ever she was in her high-powered administrative work. God is still calling people to serve in quiet ways and in exciting adventures, in routine matters and in entrepreneurial enterprises. God is calling. God calls and we serve, and when the church is running effective, it is always when the right person is serving in the right job. Not every job is right for everyone. And it always amazes me that there are some jobs in the church where only an accountant could love, and some jobs where only an extrovert could handle, or only a creative thinker could manage. And there are some jobs that only a detail person could do well, some that only a handy person could build, some things that only a green thumb could plant, some jobs that only a great communicator could speak or a great educator could teach, some jobs that only a good steward could care for. So many things that God calls us to do. Not all jobs for everyone, but each of us selected, appointed, and commissioned to be part of Christ's great commission to proclaim the good news to all peoples in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There are only 12 among the apostles in the book that we call the Acts of the Apostles. But there are billions of people among the commissioned ones, the disciples. And if we were to write a book about all of them, it might be called the book of the Acts of the Disciples. And in that book, the book would recount the minutes of a council meeting here and there. And it would recount the building of a new school or a hospital or the digging of a well in Africa or the planting of a garden in Stevens Point. That book will recount all of these deeds. Not every job will be adventurous, but all of them are led by the Spirit of God for the mission of Christ. Oh, and by the way, if, if you do happen to buy a winning lottery ticket, it's probably because God knows you will know how to use those gifts for the mission of Christ in the world. And if that happens, I want you to give me a call. I would be thrilled to help you discover the ways that God wants you to use that money. And if it does happen, I hope that you don't mind my suggesting that we hold that first meeting on your new yacht. <laughs> Amen. saints of God from vain ambitions turn Christ rose triumphant that your hearts with nobler zeal might burn speak out O saints of God despair engulfs earth's frame as is a of God the kingdom's task embrace redress sin's cruel consequence give justice larger place give heed O saints of God creation cries in pain stretch forth your
my friends, if there is a book called The Acts of the Disciples, it would contain knowledge that together the church all through these years have gathered together and said these words, I believe in God the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, creator, creator of, heaven of heaven and earth. earth. I, believe I believe in Jesus Christ, Christ God's Son only Son, Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin, Virgin Mary, Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate was, was crucified, crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he, and he will come, come to, to judge, judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God, who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. Holy God, in Christ Jesus, the joy of the church is made complete. Root the church in your word and unify us as Christ's body. Send us into the world as your loving people, ready to testify to your spirit at work. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Mighty God, the world is your handiwork, displaying your incomprehensible creativity. Seas teem with life, forests reach up to praise you, and the mystery of life lies deep in the soil. Prevent the deforestation of the rainforests that clean the air. Help us control the forest fires that pollute the air. Guard and keep this world for the well-being of all your creatures. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Gracious ruler, establish the leaders of the nations and all in authority in your grace and truth. Calm the terror that has seized your world from Tel Aviv to Calcutta, from Washington, D.C. to our hometowns. Strengthen all leaders so that the people they serve will have abundant life. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Generous Savior, you befriend those who are suffering, poor, lonely, outcast, rejected, or sick. Grant healing and love to all in need. Give them tangible signs of your steadfast love. Today we pray especially for Dan, Keith, Lori, Kent, Dolores, Oz, Jim, Cliff King and his family. We pray for Kent, Gail and Bill, Lauren and Jeff, Karen and Peggy, and all those we name in our hearts. Give to each of them the comfort and healing they seek and require. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Creator God, here in this community, we share the gifts of praying, learning, and supporting one another. Give us thankful hearts as we claim the gifts that are unique to us and keep us from being envious of others with different gifts. Give us loving hearts so that we will share these gifts and resources with those in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, friends, please receive this benediction. May the love of God be with you. May the peace of Christ calm your heart. May the flowing love of the Spirit bear you up while we're apart. May the, when you need a friend, God is with you. When you have a prayer, God is near. When you bear a pain, God will spare it. When you're alone, God is near. May the love of God be with you. May the peace of Christ calm your heart. May the flowing power of the Spirit bear you up while we're apart. good news. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God.